Welcome to Everything Co-op, bringing you information on how cooperatives can help improve your quality of life. This show is being sponsored by the National Co-op Bank, NCB. The NCB is dedicated to strengthening communities nationwide for the delivery of banking and financial services for the nation's cooperatives, their members, and other socially responsible organizations. For more information on the power of community ownership, visit ncb.coop. That's ncb.coop. Now stay tuned for your host, Vernon Oaks. Good morning, everybody. This is Vernon Oaks. Welcome to Everything Co-op. You know, today we're going to talk to Mr. Hugh Price, who has an excellent history and background, and he's put that all in a book, The African-American Life by Hugh B. Price. Good morning, Mr. Price. Hey, how are you doing, Brother Oaks? I'm fantastic. Really, really great. You know, it was great meeting you at the AFIA convention in Baltimore this year and listen to your speech, and I'm so thrilled that you decided to be on our radio program today. Well, it's it's my pleasure to be on with you and to be on WOL, uh, which is uh, always has been a prominent station. I grew up in, was born and grew up in Washington, D.C., so the call letters ring many bells for me. Yes, I... Uh, I met Kathy Hughes probably 25 years ago when I had a show trying to help people buy a home and all of the benefits of and how they could get into purchasing a home. But right now is about this cooperative world that I'm talking about and what's so exciting about your book, and I would like for you to talk about it. But first, could you talk a little bit about your life? Because it's so fascinating. <laughs> Uh, well, uh, it, it goes back many, many generations. I'm, uh, as I wrote in the book, I'm a direct descendant of a man named Nero Hawley, who fought in the American Revolution uh, at Valley Forge under the command of General George Washington. And he was one of a number of African Americans and Native Americans who fought in the American Revolution and who for many years weren't acknowledged by groups like the Daughters of the American Revolution and others. And his story is so important because, as Gail Buckley wrote in her book, uh, American Patriots, the Revolutionary War Army, she said, was the most diverse and integrated army between then and the Vietnam War, which astonished me. Mm. Another interesting ancestor and complicated story was a man by the name of Robert Gunnell, who was my great-great-great-grandfather, who lived in Langley, Virginia, uh, just on the other side of the Potomac. He was an uh, African American mulatto, and he he uh, bought his freedom in the 1830s, and then he purchased his wife and eight children and a couple of other people in order to protect them from being seized by white slave owners. And at the time that slaves were freed in Washington D.C., which is where he and his uh, you know brood were at the time, he was paid over two thousand dollars as compensation for the liberation of his property. Uh, namely the slaves, uh, and he had bought them, as I say, to protect them. And he lived just a short walk from what is now the CIA headquarters over on old Georgetown Pike in uh, in uh, uh, Langley. Um, other ancestors, my father uh, grew up and uh, was born and grew up in Washington, D.C., and actually lived in Georgetown when it was a predominantly black neighborhood. And his mother, uh, the quite remarkable Miss Irene Payne Price, was um, very active in the Zion Church over in Georgetown, a legendary church. A couple of other ancestors of note, my great-great-great-grandfather, George Latimer, and uh, his wife, my great-great-great-grandmother, Rebecca, escaped from Norfolk, Virginia. Um, he, too, was a very fair-skinned mulatto. She was very brown-skinned. They stowed away on a boat as far as Baltimore. Then, if you can believe this, they traveled as master and slave, by train up to Philly and then traveled his husband and wife the rest of the way to Boston. What year was that? That was 1842. And his slave master got wind that he was up there and tried to recapture him. It became a very famous case of Frederick Douglass and William Lloyd Garrison and the other abolitionists up there prevented his recapture as one of the first fugitive slave cases to gain a lot of national attention. Mm -hmm. I'd like Sorry. to just interrupt you real quick. Yeah. Fred, when you mentioned Frederick Douglass in the same kind of time frame, he stole away and went to, to Europe as a right. slave. Right. And um, the cooperators over there 
uh, supported him. Matter of fact, one of them gave him about one third of the money that he needed to buy his. Oh, is that right? Yes. Yeah. And it, it goes back that far. He left as a slave, and over there, with the help of the cooperators, he bought his freedom. That's remarkable. Uh, and That's came remarkable. back as a freed man. That's remarkable. Well, George and Rebecca Latimer had several children, including my great-great-grandmother, Margaret Latimer, who was married to the great-grandson of this man, Nero Hawley, who fought in the American Revolution. Her brother was a famous inventor by the name of Louis Latimer, who became a famous inventor, who helped Alexander Graham Bell perfect the, his application for the telephone patent so he could be first in line. And then he also worked with Thomas Edison and perfected the carbon filament in the light bulb that Edison had invented so that it would burn longer. And Lewis Latimer was one of the members of the charter members of the Edison pioneers. So all of these ancestors are interesting in their own right, but they also, the reason I wrote about them was because they tell a larger story not unlike what you said about Frederick Douglass, which was the determination of our people to do whatever, stow away, do whatever, in order to become free. And then Lewis Latimer showed all the amazing contributions that African Americans have made to the modernization of this country and all the conveniences that we take for granted. Mm -hmm. um, our folks have been right in there did you with know those about inventions, this? with those innovations. But did you know about this growing up? My mother talked about it a lot, but I was a knuckleheaded kid, so what did I care? <laughs> <laughs> like, like me. Okay. All right. I'm, I, we lived right up the street from uh, Howard University, so I just wanted to go to baseball games at Griffith Stadium. I said, you can tell me about this another time. And the funny thing is, on that point, I used to date a girl who lived in Brooklyn when I was in college, and I would drive up to see her, and I stayed with my Aunt Louise Latimer, who was Louis Latimer's daughter, in their house, and I slept in his bedroom and in his bed. And she would say to me, I want you to come to breakfast tomorrow, and I'm going to tell you all about your famous great uncle and your great great grandmother, and et cetera, et cetera. And I would say, Aunt Louise, I got to go to Brooklyn right now. So how do I get on the Brooklyn Queens Expressway? <laughs> Where do I get off to go to Brooklyn? Mm -hmm. That's what I need to know now. So I just miss that amazing opportunity to learn all about. Our ancestors, and it's something I tell young people all the time, don't take this for granted. There's noble history in all of our lives. And, you know, find out what you can about your ancestors while you can. Uh, you have such a rich, 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 rich history. I've, I've just been learning about my ancestors, but there's nowhere. Like Louis Latimer, I had read about him, but to get the connections of the dots of your family and what he was able to do. I grew up in Bluefield, West Virginia, and I uh -huh. went to white schools. We integrated in 1955 in elementary school, so right. all the way through. And so I hated history. I didn't care <laughs> for it, and I figured out later why. We were not in any of the books. That's right. Uh, That's right. Uh, and, and it was all about dates and names and not about what you're talking about, the, the, the philosophy behind it, the, the lessons learned. And you've got so much in this book. It's a wonderful read. Thank uh, you. This well, my mother was a professional mess. archivist, and she uh, worked at the Moreland Room at Howard University, so she knew what she was doing when she was tracking down this history. But I'd say, you know, not all of the ancestors were people who were really historically consequential. I mean, I had a—and my father's aunt lived in Charles County, just south of Washington, D.C., with her husband. He was a country preacher, and they were farmers. And I just used to think she was a country preacher's wife, and then when I was writing the book— I read up about her retirement somewhere, and it turns out she'd been a school teacher in Charles County. She had studied at uh, extension courses, I think, from New York University and a bunch of other places. She'd been a lifetime member of the uh, International Reading Association of the NAACP, and I said, dang, mm -hmm. <laughs> there was a lot more to this modest country preacher's wife than I thought, and I was embarrassed. I was embarrassed for myself that I was so ignorant about her. So that's, again, the point about young people tracking down this history because you never know what kind of nobility and struggle there is by people who were the building blocks of our community over the generations. Well, the other really nice thing is if you can learn this history younger, you really get appreciation for the history and what people have gone through, and therefore you study more. <laughs> you, you well, get yeah, more and there, there are a lot more. It's almost like working a detective mystery because the more you learn, the more – you unfold the story you, or peel away the onions and you learn just more and more. And there's so many more 
tools available now. I mean, you can go on to Ancestry.com, and I found things that were written on Google about that ancestor Robert Gunnell by a direct descendant of his former slave master. And there it was on Google. I Googled his name, and all this stuff popped up about him. And the same thing is true of George Latimer. Absolutely fascinating. So you didn't learn this at an early age, but how do you think this impacted your life? Because your life by itself is phenomenal. Um, I think probably it contributed to the DNA package <laughs> that I, I inherited, just all that striving and struggling. But in, in my, my own life when I was growing up, uh, my mother was very much an activist in Washington, D.C. I mean, I, I, when I grew up in D.C., everything was segregated. The schools were segregated, the movie theaters, department stores, the whole thing. So Washington was a sleepy town down south. But my, my parents were neighbors of Charles Hamilton Houston, who, you know, led the fight to desegregate the schools until he passed the baton after after his after his death. The baton was passed to Thurgood Marshall. But we lived on New Hampshire Avenue and Park Road, and, and uh, Charles Hamilton Houston lived right up the street from us. So I felt all that. My parents helped to finance the early school desegregation lawsuits that Houston brought. My mother was involved in efforts to improve the minimum wage through the League of Women Voters, and she was involved in progressive politics through the Americans for Democratic Action. So she was she was very much in all of the struggles to get the vote for Washington, D.C. When I was growing up, we could not vote for president or anybody. So I, I felt all that. Then I, I came of age in uh, 19, when I graduated from high school in 1959 and 1963, I participated in the March on Washington as a marshal in that march. And the excitement and the vision and the hope embodied in that march reached me very powerfully. People just a year or two older than me were going on the Freedom Rides in the South. And people like you know Robert Moses and uh, Marion Wright Edelman down there registering voters. And so those Young people, Julian Bond, those, John Lewis, those folks were just a year or two ahead of me, so they were living legends of my generation. And Kennedy talked a good good game, but Lyndon Johnson really got it done when he said that, um, you know, we're going to end poverty in our lifetimes. He said that not long after he took over as president. I believed him. He's, he's the man. He can do it. And so that was – and then the cities were percolating in the north. And the civil rights movement was very active in the South, and Martin Luther King was, you know, at the forefront there. So that was the environment in which I was raised. And I felt called to get involved both because of the genes I inherited, the example set by my mother particularly, and um, the environment into which I was uh, brought as, as a very young adult. So the course was charted for me whether I wanted to do it or not. Well, that is fascinating. I graduated in, from high school in 65, so you had several years on me. But I remember watching all of that on TV. Listen, we got to take our first break, and then uh, we'll come back and talk more. Uh, if anybody out there would like to ask Mr. Hugh Price any questions, you can call in at 1-800-450-7876. 1-800-450-7876. Born and raised right here in Washington, D.C., in a fabulous life and a wonderful history. We'll be right back. Washington, D.C.'s News Talk, 1450 AM WON and 95.9 FM. Information is power. This is Vernon Oaks. The program is Everything Cooperative. This program is sponsored by the National Cooperative Bank, whose mission is to support and be an advocate for America's cooperatives and their members, especially, especially in low-income communities, by providing innovative financial and related services. And more often than not, in those low-income communities, you will find African Americans, Native Americans, Latino Americans, both in urban and rural settings. So uh, NCB's mission is to go out into those neighborhoods and help fund cooperative businesses. And Mr. Hugh Price is our guest today. We're talking about his book, This African American Life, who he's native Washingtonian with a wonderful, wonderful history. Uh, did you or your family members work with Du Bois anyway? They were inspired by him, particularly my mother, uh, but uh, 
I don't know that they had any direct contact with them. My, my mother got her BA degree from uh, Howard. Well, just by everybody in my family went to Howard except for me. But she studied with great uh, people like uh, Professor John Hope Franklin and Professor Ralph Bunch. Can you imagine having them as your faculty? Mm. Mm. <laughs> Can you imagine? So Du Bois' influence was obviously there on campus. He was he was a, a you know intellectual force of nature. He's a phenomenal man. Well, because he wrote about co-ops and black-owned oh, okay. cooperative businesses. Uh, okay. Explained that blacks had pooled their resources through churches, mutual and mutual aid societies, right. and fraternal organizations, and they jointly owned businesses. So it was very, very big for him, and he wrote a lot about it. Mm-hmm. Uh, it wasn't until nothing was written sort of big about co-ops until Jessica Gordon Nimhard wrote a book called Collective Courage, and that uh-huh. came out a few years ago, talking about the cooperative businesses, and it was amazing. She said when she started, it sounds like when you started this book, you had a lot of a lot of knowledge by your mom and others, but she said she was told it wasn't much history, and she, she keeps learning about history, and it's a phenomenal read, mm-hmm. Collective Courage. Uh, you may want to take a look. It would be interesting to compare your book and time frame with what she has talked about, and some of that I want to talk about today, including... Well, I mean, as you, as you know, and as we've discussed, I, when I was teaching at the Woodrow Wilson School at Princeton, I taught a course on cooperatives. Uh, a lot of my graduate students were very interested, and so I, I hadn't known much about the movement before then. I knew there was cooperative housing, and I knew there were dairy cooperatives, but I, it really expanded my horizons, and it run the gamut from... Um, you know, home health care cooperatives like they have in uh, New York, particularly I think based in the Bronx, there's several thousand home health care workers own a cooperative business all the way to uh, there's a company called Mondragon in the Basque country of Spain, which I think is the 10th largest industrial conglomerate. And it's a cooperative uh, in all of Spain. They make they make dishwashers. <laughs> they, make, they make almost everything. Everything. They have a bank, a school. <laughs> And it was always interesting that co-ops grew up when nobody else would come. The capitalistic right. models would not come in. To well, that's a, you know the, the the growth of the community development corporations in this country is a, is very similar. When um, you know things became pretty dicey in cities and there were a lot of disturbances and traditional businesses pulled out, it was the community development corporations that stepped into the breach and brought a combination of. Uh, uh, government financing, foundation financing, and then eventually uh, private financing to help spur the revitalization of uh, neighborhoods. But if you look at a lot of neighborhoods that have come back from the abyss, you'd find that community development corporations, community-controlled development corporations have been the real catalyst for change. All right. Absolutely. Let me quickly, for everybody out there, give you a, a quick definition of co-ops, because so, you mentioned several of them. But there's a there are if it's owned and controlled by the employees, it's called a worker cooperative. And so any business you can think of could be owned and controlled by the employees. If it's owned and controlled by the people that uses the products or services, uh, it's called a consumer cooperative. And that's credit unions and housing co-ops, which you mentioned. That worker cooperative in New York, that home health care cooperative, over 2,000 home health care folks, then the, on the other two side, the two major types of co-ops, before I go there, food co-ops could either be owned by the workers or owned by the consumers. Now you have farmers and artists are going into buying uh, purchasing co-ops. So they come together and they may buy their seed or their fertilizers or they may buy a tractor together and use it. So they, they pool their resources to get what they need. And then on the other side, they have marketing co-ops. And a lot of those are dairies, cooperatives, uh, Cabot Cheese is one or Cabot Creamery. I think Land O'Lakes is one, too. Land O'Lakes is another one. Yeah, right. So, yeah, inter- I mean, internationally renowned brand names actually are cooperatives. They're sort of, pro- yeah, you're, they're producer cooperatives. Right. In effect, yeah. And so you, you, you have all of these co-ops, and most people don't know about them. We had a meeting at the White House 2012. The United Nations declared co-ops. 2012 is the year of the cooperatives. Mm-hmm. And um, one of the high-up, in Obama's administration, we, one guy asked everybody, do you know about co-ops or do you belong to one? And one guy said no and said, well, do you belong to a credit union? And he said yes. <laughs> <laughs> okay. So most people don't even know the names right, of co-ops. Right, right. Um, 
there is a there is a consumer cooperative in Madison, Wisconsin. It's a, a health clinic. It's owned by the patients, mm-hmm. so it's a patient centric cooperative. Um, so, a lot of lot of good benefits, a lot of good benefits for for co ops. So, let's go back to to your book. What prompted you to write this book? I wanted to. My mother had done all that family research. And I had been fortunate enough to have uh, an interesting and unorthodox professional career. And, you know, I was raised under circumstances uh, in segregated Washington. A lot of people of younger generations don't realize. So there are these three pieces of the story that, frankly, I wanted to set down in a book for my children, my nieces and nephews, their children and nieces and nephews and anybody else who might be interested. Anybody else would be sort of frosting on the cake for me. I wanted to put it in print for for our family so that they wouldn't have to scramble around to figure it out the way I did. I started working on it in 2003, and I had a book agent, and she talked to some publishers, and they wanted me – the publisher said, why don't you write a book about what it was like to deal with President Bill Clinton? And I said, that's not the book I'm interested in doing. And so I stopped working on it in 2003. I probably wrote about two-thirds of it back then. And I, it sat in my laptop for 13 or 14 years hmm. until 2015 when I said, well, I know how to self-publish a book. Let me start to work on this again, and come hell or high water, I'm going to publish this even if I have to pay to self-publish it. But let me shop around and see if I can find a publisher who would do it. And uh, a wonderful outfit named John F. Blair in North Carolina got very interested. And so I finished it up, and it came out in May of this year. So it was a, it was a long journey. But I was fortunate because my mother had done all that ancestral research. Ernest, she left me boxes with folders, with everything in the folders, and with typed labels. Oh, my goodness. <laughs> <laughs> so I didn't have to go rummaging around all over the trade place to figure this out. She had, she and her sister had done all that background work, and she had the skills to do it. So I just basically committed the story she had told me and the research that she had done to the first part of the book, and then based on my own recollections, my conversations with my, my brother, et cetera, um, I took it forward from my life in Washington, D.C., and then out uh, into my professional career. So where can somebody get this book? A variety of places. Some bookstores carry it. It's a little hard to predict, you know, which ones, but some carry it. Directly all bookstores can get it. Independent bookstores and the big chains like Barnes and Noble. You can also, uh, you know, get it on Amazon or get uh, get it through the Barnes and Noble website and some other websites. Probably Walmart's website. So it, it's it's widely available in hard copy, also available as a, a digital and downloadable edition. And so, if you can't find it through the bookstore, or don't want to order it through a bookstore, you can get it uh, online. This African American Life by Hugh Price. It's a wonderful read. I think you really, really enjoy it. And I'm not a reader. Um, <laughs> I grew up in math, and they said, "Why did you go math?" They thought I was smart, and I said, "No, nah, because I couldn't read or write." Oh. <laughs> so that was all that was left, which was quite interesting. I found out some of the reasons why as I as I've continued to study. Well, um, you were an early expert in STEM education, right? Really was. I uh, started teaching in 1969. Mm-hmm. Really, to keep from going to Vietnam, my parents, my father and grandfather, World War Two and World War One, respectively, they didn't understand that war, and they said, you know, that three, there was three of us. Uh, they, they couldn't sort of support us going there, mm-hmm. and so I taught and found out. I, my mother taught. Um, she went back to school, and matter of fact, she grew up in D.C. from three months old to sixteen, mm-hmm. and then they moved to New York. My father and mother met in World War Two in New York. And he was from West Virginia, so he took her back home. I said that was the best thing, the smartest thing he did in his life. But anyway, <laughs> okay. So, you know, growing up in Bluefield, West Virginia, there was just not a lot of this kind of history, just mm-hmm. not a mm-hmm. lot of it at all. I admire, I would love to have grown up. I remember in the sixth grade coming up here and mm-hmm. going to the uh, museums, but, mm-hmm. again, not black history. Not black history at all. Right. We got it 
you know, the, as I mentioned, the schools when I was coming along in Washington were segregated. So the the pictures of Frederick Douglass and Thurgood Marshall and Jackie Robinson and all the Ralph Bunch, those were plastered all over the walls of my school at BK Bruce oh Elementary School. And uh, so I was aware of that. My parents knew some of those people. My parents had both gone to Howard. Their friends were from Howard, and we lived right up the street from Howard. So, Hugh, Hugh we got to take the yeah. next, next break. I'm sorry. Okay. I, I, I'm so enthused with this, I forgot all about it. We'll be, <laughs> right, we'll be right back. Please don't touch that down. Washington, D.C.'s News Talk, 1450 AM, WOS, and 95.9 FM. Welcome back, everybody. This is Vernon Oaks. The program is Everything Cooperative. We have Mr. Hugh Price on the line with us this morning. We thank him so much for taking out his time. Hugh, can you talk a little bit more about your history, your career? Right. I graduated from law school in 1966, and the first step was uh, serving as a legal services lawyer in uh, New Haven, Connecticut, representing poor folks who could not afford their own lawyers. Not long after I started that career, you know, there were a lot of riots around the country, and New Haven erupted in 1967, and I was hired by a new group called the Black Coalition of New Haven. It was an amalgam of groups like the NAACP and the Urban League and the Nation of Islam and community groups and stuff to try to help put the pieces of the city back together again, to rebuild the spirit of our community, rebuild the bridges uh, between our communities. So I did that for a couple of years. It was a fascinating right to, to be right in the center of the community organizing action at that stage and to help repair the city. And I did a couple of other things in uh New York, in, in, in New Haven. In 1978, I got an extraordinary offer to become a member of the editorial board of the New York Times, uh, which meant writing editorials for the newspaper. It was something that came totally out of the blue, uh, surprised me. Um, so we moved to the New York area in 78 and have lived here ever since. It was fascinating writing editorials. Uh, I picked probably 97% of the topics that I wrote on. I wrote about uh, urban policy and education and uh, telecommunications. Um, and my viewpoint, based on my analysis of the issue, became the viewpoint of the newspaper in about 95% of those cases. So it was a very, mm. very affirming experience. In uh, 1982, I was recruited to go into public television uh, Channel 13 in New York, WNET, which is the largest public television station in the country. I initially ran the local station that you would watch, which would be the local programming, local fundraising and everything. And then in mid-1984, I was appointed head of the National Production Division, which means I ran the division that produces great performances in nature and American masters and art of the Western world and the mind and all of those great series that Channel 13 made, and we were co-producers of the McNeil Lair News Hour. Um, I did that for about four and a half years. I made a run for the presidency in 1987, and it didn't happen. Uh, and actually, they only gave several inside candidates like me a 20-minute interview, and I was really enraged. I'd sort of smacked my head against the glass ceiling for the first time. Mm. And uh, so I started looking around, and a friend became the president of the Rockefeller Foundation. And I sent a signal to him that if he wanted to talk, I was ready to. So he, he brought me over as uh, vice president of the Rockefeller Foundation, where I oversaw our grant making and education and equal opportunity. Did that for six years, was having a great time, and then the opportunity to compete for the job of a lifetime materialized when I was recruited for the presidency of the National Urban League in wow. 1994. Yeah. I had always dreamt of having an opportunity to sit at the desk where Whitney Young and Vernon Jordan and John Jacob, et cetera, had sat and to be at the helm of a, of a legendary organization like that. And it was the thrill of a lifetime to be selected for that. And I, I did that for nine years figured then it was time to pass the baton to a younger generation. And I was with a law firm after that for a couple of years, and then I sort of capped my career 
by teaching in the Woodrow Wilson School at Princeton for five years as a visiting professor from 2008 to 2013. Couldn't hold a job. You know, I just kept moving from job to job. But I was fortunate to come along at a time when there were lots of lots of opportunities presented themselves. And um, and uh, I was just really blessed. Absolutely. Totally blessed. Um, they blessed by the best. And uh, just a tremendous amount of experience. But how did it feel when you first hit that glass wall, that glass ceiling when you went for presidency? I was I was crushed. I figured, you know, I'd gone to a very fine college and a very fine law school, so I had the paper credentials. I thought I'd done a good job running the Metropolitan Division, which was about a third of the station. I'd run the, the big production engine, the highest profile part of the station, so I figured I had the experience and all the credentials, and it didn't matter. Right. <laughs> I wasn't chosen. So I, was in, I didn't go into depression, but I certainly was in a funk for about five or six months. And if we had been wealthy, I'd have quit. Uh, but my wife kept saying, don't do anything dumb. You know, you have me, you've got children, you've got a mortgage. Don't do anything dumb. <laughs> and it's funny, I was, I was uh, you know, mumping around in the kitchen one day, and our eldest daughter, who was pretty spiritual at the time, said to me, this, and she said this in 1987. She said, don't worry about not getting that job. You're being saved for something more important. Oh, my God. And the clouds cleared. <laughs> and I said, okay. The angels so I sang. got myself together again. Okay. But the something more important she saw over the horizon was six years over the horizon because it would, when the National Urban League opportunity happened, I said, that's what she saw. She couldn't, name it. It. she couldn't name it, but she knew that there was a door. Was, she knew it was coming. She said there's something more important. And when, Lord, when I got that job, I said, this is the thing. This is a contribution I've dreamt of being able to make my entire life. And I felt like I'd been preparing for it my entire life. So she was right. And I, I, I gave it everything I had intellectually and physically. And uh, uh, it, was, it was the job of a lifetime for so me. So when one door is shut. And I know if you see, when we look ahead, we say, oh, I really want this. I'm ready for this. But that door is shut. Do you think it was because of your blackness? Um, it may have been. There was another uh, black candidate, a good friend by the name of George Miles, who went on to head the uh, public television station in Pittsburgh and was responsible for bringing all that wonderful soul and R&B concerts to public television. That was his idea. But there were two other candidates, so it, it, it may have been the station may not have been ready for that, but also the station did go into commercial television to make a hire, so they may just have felt that they wanted to go with an experienced hand in commercial television. You know, when the door shut, I didn't, I didn't try to go dissect what happened. I just said, damn, mm -hmm. <laughs> okay, you all, you all told me something. I didn't want to stick around because I figured that if I couldn't be in the engine driving the train through all the change that was beginning to happen in public television and to public television with the advent of cable and all that, I didn't want to be in the caboose getting whipsawed by, by all the change. So right. it was just time to move. And frankly, you know, public television had been a fascinating detour for me professionally, given all the other work that it focused on opportunity and, and developing our young people and education, et cetera. So I felt like it was time to get back to the knitting and the foundation opportunity giving away other people's money was, was a lot of fun and very creative. And then, as I say, the job that I have dreamt of my entire life uh, materialized in 1994. And so I said, okay, I'm, I'm, I'm prepared. I'm eager. When I went through the interview, I didn't even ask how much money do they pay. Right. Okay. <laughs> it took me 45 seconds in the interview. They said, if you are asked to do this, will you do it? And I said, I'm good to go. I told my wife later, she said, don't you want to think about it? I said, I know my head, my heart, and my gut are all in alignment. So let's go. Amen. Let's right. do it. All right. Hey, did you have the opportunity of working with or meeting Thurgood Marshall? No, he was a legend from afar. Um, I mean, I, I followed his work, obviously benefited from his work, and I've used the phrase. I'm, I'm involved with a nonprofit uh, cinema, art house cinema, called the Jacob Burns Film Center in uh, Westchester County. I've just been asked to moderate the discussion following the screening of the new movie about him called Marshall. And uh, his son, John Marshall, is going to be there. So for Thurgood, for me, of my generation, was one of the figures on Black Folks Mount Rushmore. You know, he was up there with Martin and with 
uh, Frederick Douglass and uh, Sojourner Truth and all of those folks. So he, he, he was a legend, but I, I never met him. He was older than, you know, a good deal older than me. But uh, I don't know whether my parents don't say they knew his mentor, Charles Hamilton Houston. But I, I didn't have any interaction with him. The reason I bring him up is because he has a history in cooperatives. Uh, oh, is that right? I didn't know that. Wouldn't surprise me, but I didn't know that. Uh, he lived in a corp called the Dunbar. Okay. And um, it was named after Paul Lawrence Dunbar, and the Rockefellers uh-huh. built it in 1928. Right. Um, so, and he, he also, with his first wife who passed, right. but he, he delivered groceries in a grocery, in a food co-op. Oh, is that right? Yeah. Okay. It's kind of like, he, you don't think of early on people like him not having any money. Right. <laughs> but, uh, he, Most he of us not. don't have any money. <laughs> <laughs> That's the story of our existence. <laughs> not many of us are born in the penthouse, you know. <laughs> Yeah, there was a uh, a nice piece uh, comparing uh, it was Obama with Mitt Romney and one other guy, and looking at the yeah. houses they grew up in. Yeah, and then they say they made it on the, their own. Uh, yeah, even the so, current president, you know, the view his view is he made it on his own, but not right. looking at how much money his father gave him and how many times yeah. he bailed him yeah. out. Yeah, uh, yeah. No, no, we didn't. We didn't come that way. No. <laughs> no, that was a path we didn't tread, that's for sure. Young people, I know you've written a couple of books for young folks. Uh, what, what do you tell them now? Well, uh, uh, several things. One is having grown up in Washington with so many parents and in-laws and family friends who are products of Howard and products of Dunbar High School in Washington, I tell them we need to know which end is up and which is the way forward, and it's through education. And when I was coming along, yes, there was segregation right in our faces, sanctioned by the law, but my parents and their friends always said, don't internalize that obstacle. It's an obstacle to be overcome, whether you go through it, around it, over top of it, or underneath it. But look at the other side and figure out how you're going to get through this obstacle and don't let it stop you psychologically. So I try to tell them that. And the way to go forward is becoming prepared, becoming an educated person prepared for citizenship. Second thing, you've got to, you've got to have some drive and some ambition. And I th- you've also got to understand that you don't get anywhere by yourself. And there are prior generations that built the steps that you that you climb. And therefore, you've got to build more steps from your way forward, and you've also got to reach out and help others. So whether you make a career of service, whether it's in education or community development, or whether you make a career in the traditional private sector, practicing law or working for a company, or whether you're an entrepreneur, in addition to what you do on your own account for your own benefit, you want to tithe with your time or tithe with your money in order to help the next generation move forward. And that's something that we as members of the village have an obligation to do. And the reality is that far too many of our young people are struggling with inadequate support, inadequate education, et cetera, inadequate mentoring. And so whatever course young people pick as adults for their own careers, they want to give back and reach out as they uh, commence that journey. Uh, Tonight, I'm being honored. I'm really blessed by a group called the Westchester Clubman, a group of professional men in Westchester County, and I was president of it in the early 1990s, and we started a mentoring program and where we ponied up some serious money ourselves to pay for full-time mentors and tutors to work with young brothers in the middle schools who are struggling in school and trying to help them stay on, get on course and stay on course. And the program has been around uh, almost 30 years. Fantastic. Really great. Almost 30, 30 years. Uh, and it's been quite successful. So it's something that everybody can do. And I just tell folks, you know, when you, if you're an older person and you're done sending your kids through college, you know, we kind of OD on the tuition we don't have to pay and we don't need to get the $80,000 car. We can get the $75,000 car and give some of that difference. Or we can get the $35,000 car instead of the $30,000 car and give some of that back to the organizations that are trying to bring uh, the next generation of young people along who really need support. 
All right, we got a final break coming up right now. We'll be right back. Information is power. This is Vernon Oaks, Everything Cooperative, and we're giving you the information about co-ops so that you could either find out of co-ops in your area to support them. Normally, co-ops are developed to solve a community problem. A group of people come together and create a business to solve a problem, and normally you get a better product as good as, uh, not better product than what others will give you at a competitive, if not lower, price. So, you can look for co-ops in your area or look to form your own. And Mr. Hugh Price is our guest today. Um, it was great listening to you talking about what to tell young people. One of the things I try to tell people about this co-op model, when you start talking about how to get a job or start entrepreneur, uh, one way is pulling together resources, and whether that's money or talent or skills, and here what the research says, and I talked about Dr. Jessica gordon Nimhard, who wrote this book, is that uh, 90% of co-ops, worker owner or others, are still in existence after five years. Mm. We're only 20 or 30% of the uh, capitalistic model businesses are still around. Yeah, fascinating. Around I didn't years. know that. Uh, and one of the reasons there, there are values and principles of co-ops uh, started uh, not started in 1844, but uh, the, the British are, uh, from the United Kingdom they put these principles together. And the fifth principle is the first thing that I learned. Of, I learned by co-ops by managing housing co-ops. That's what I do mm-hmm. for a living, property management. So the fifth principle is education, training, and information. That's at the core. And what Dr. Jessica gordon Nimhart said in her book is when they had these co-ops start, a lot of them d- came out of the civil rights movement, mm-hmm. uh, particularly the Federation of Southern Co-ops in, uh, in 13 states, southern states, uh, trying to help blacks to keep their land and to pool their resources together right. so that they could get to different markets. Uh, but this education, training, and information is at the core. And she said that what people when they started having trouble, they would go back to their... Uh, education bees, they're having, you know, to study. Uh, and I've seen old, uh, seniors in a housing co-op who may have a high school education really run their business extremely well, mm-hmm. extremely mm-hmm. well, because they hold each other accountable. They learn. Right. Which way is up. <laughs> <laughs> the shareholder's right there in the face, right? It's your, it's, it's your next-door neighbor. <laughs> yes, yes. Uh, and then there's the values. Uh, co-ops are based on values of self-help, not looking for somebody else to help, but self-help, self-responsibility, democracy, equality, equity, and solidarity. And in the tradition of the founders of cooperative, cooperative members believe in the ethical values of honesty, openness, social responsibility, and caring for others, caring for one another. And that's the other reason I like co-ops is that you you look at people and you're in the meetings with them and they make the they make decisions based on what's best for the group, mm-hmm. not what's best for me or best for my friend or best. And when pe- when you find co-ops that are people are doing that, they may get into government uh, like presidents of co-ops. If they're making decisions what's best for them or their friends, that co-op is going to go under. It, it may take a while, mm-hmm. but it, it will eventually go under, and not be strong. But when they make decisions that's best for everybody. It's amazing what <laughs> folks can do. And I think this is what churches and synagogues, uh, mosques do. They, everybody pitches in a little bit, and you can get a lot done. When right, right. In. So I like this co-op model. I like it for its values, its principles, and helping people, everyday people, gain financial wealth and social wealth. They really learn how to work together. Well, they also gain political wealth because they understand how to participate in the decision-making process as a, as a stakeholder. And that carries over into how we should conduct ourselves in the, in the political realm and as, as citizens of communities. So the co-op is a microcosm of the broader community that we're part of. Well, see, I also believe that it's of human nature as human beings that we really are meant to work in groups in community. Uh, we talk about the Lone Ranger aspect and John Wayne and on the TV, that's what they, I did this. But no, if you look at 
there was at least Tonto with the Lone Ranger. Right. <laughs> but right. there was always somebody else helping him. <laughs> right. Uh, in right. the community, somebody else watching out for him. And so I think that's what is at the core. And at the Urban League, early on, the young cooperators of New York used to meet at the Urban League. Hmm. You're telling me something I didn't know. You should, I should have known that. It's fascinating. Uh, I got it out of Jessica Gordon M. Hart's book, but it's amazing that all of this history about co-ops, of people working together, but it turned out that in McCarthy area, uh, they were labored communists, and so you didn't really want to be out front talking about co-ops. Mm-hmm. Uh, mm-hmm. Yeah, so it, it's gotten a bad name for a lot of different places. But another piece of this, I talked to a guy out of Chicago who was talking about how many manufacturing companies there are who baby boomers own, and they're ready to, it's a great opportunity for the workers to own those, either as an ESOP, uh, employee stock owner purchase, or as a co-op. And what I like about co-ops is own and control, where an ESOP, you mm-hmm. cannot control it. Mm-hmm. Uh, mm-hmm. So looking at there's a lot of different places where the employees can own these businesses, and it seems like it's a great time for it. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Uh, I love your book. We, Thank you. We don't have very much time, so tell me, what do you want to leave people with? What are your what are the secrets to life that you've learned? Well, I think one is to understand what, where we came from and the nobility of the lives that our ancestors have led. You know, some of my ancestors were well known and consequential, but most of them are totally unknown. And I'm, I mean, I think back to. My ancestors in Charles County, who became free right after the end of the Civil War and the lives they had to forge, they're out in KKK country on their own, off the land, and they built from that base, and they were very, very strong people. So I think we have very strong, resilient people in the African-American community. A second lesson is the importance of service whether and of giving back, whether that's a full-time career, you make that a full-time career, or whether if you're doing something else that doesn't entail that on a full-time basis and giving back somehow or the other through community organizations, through mentoring, through the church, et cetera. And the third thing is the importance of, of an activist life, being aware of what's going on in the world, having a set of values that are you know, community-minded, open-spirited, and focused on helping people get ahead. I mean, one of the things that I've devoted most of my career to since it happened to me was helping people get second chances, helping people who, as I use the phrase, and George W. Bush used this phrase, the misunderestimated. That happened to me when I had people tell me that I probably get to go to college, but I shouldn't count on going to graduate school or professional school, even though I was an A student. So somebody just looked at my race and said, you're not going to amount to nothing. Mm -hmm. And so... Having your radar up for that, your radar screen set to detect that kind of stuff and overcome it, and the importance of parents or families or aunts and uncles or pastors or somebody there that a young person can be connected to, can uh, serve as a source of inspiration and guidance is hugely, hugely important. All young people need that kind of support, whether it comes from the immediate family or the extended family or the community can't let children be reared in isolation or under the influence of gangs and others who don't mean them well because the uh, world out there is rough it's competitive and they need to know how to prepare themselves but they also need to be shepherded through that journey toward adulthood and beyond and then they've got to work hard i always work very hard always try to figure out what i had to do to be successful on the job and then up the ante from there and 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 try to get in you know put in even more effort uh, and then you got to have a lot of luck, and you got to have uh, you call mentors, godfathers, rabbis. you got to have somebody who's well-connected and wise who will show you the way so that you won't inadvertently walk, walk your way into trouble or can help advise you on how to navigate the terrain that's in front of you. And those are some of the things that uh, I've taken away. And I think lastly, I just think we're, we're in a particularly challenging time where, in, you know, after – the euphoria over Obama and with what's going on with with the Trump administration now, it's really a a shock to the system. And I think that's all the more reason why folks have to be active and engaged and protecting the rights that have been gained, protecting the basic democratic institutions of our society, free press, freedom of speech, freedom of assembly. Uh, Those are all on the line now. And uh, 
got to stand strong for all of those core values of uh, of being an American citizen. And we've got to try for all of our struggles over individual issues to reconnect as Americans. Uh, We have this great experiment called America, which is the most remarkable experiment of any society on earth, in my view, doesn't come unglued because we allow ourselves to drift apart and and lose sight of the common conditions that that we all operate under. I mean, one of the fascinating things when you analyze, well, folks say, well, you know, people lost sight of what happened with uh, working class and low income whites and working class and low income blacks. The economic conditions that explain why people are struggling are similar across racial lines. Yeah. It's astonishing. But we have politicians who would build a wall so we can't see that, yeah. <laughs> build walls between us. And we've got to tear down those walls between us and understand that the solution to declining wages for working people, the solutions to the gig economy and the lack of stability in people's lives are the same across. Does not make any difference? It doesn't make any difference. Poverty doesn't care. It does not care. It does not care. And so we all have to understand that and we have to learn how to talk across and over these walls that people try to build because folks in power are afraid if that happens, you know, a whole new force is is unleashed politically, but that's Mm -hmm. what's going to happen. We got to go and that's a great place to leave from. Thank you so very much. much. I really appreciate your taking the time. My pleasure. Everybody, this next week, live cooperatively. Washington, D.C.'s News Talk, 1450 AM, WOL, and 95.9 FM.